Hello, hello, hello. So how you guys doing? Hope you all are doing well. So welcome to another Z Classroom Live session here on our Twitch channel. So I'm your host, Joseph Drust, and uh, we're gonna do some uh, sculpting basics today. So let me give me a shout out if you guys can hear me and also see the uh, ZBrush trial webpage here. Make sure you guys have all the audio stuff working and whatnot. So what we're gonna do today in this stream is I'm gonna focus more back in on the basics. So if you guys uh, followed along on Tuesday's stream, Wednesday's stream, Wednesday's stream, um, I'm continuing more on that kind of basic type element of getting into ZBrush and learning ZBrush. So sort of the Z Classroom Live uh, project-based stuff. So with this, um, I just have a web page open here, and this is for the ZBrush 2020 trial. So with the trial, a lot of you guys may be stuck at home, and so we're doing a hashtag uh, ZBrush at home, kind of see what you guys are doing, if you're sculpting anything while you're at home. And during this time of uh, crazy crisis that's happening, uh, we as developers are gonna start streaming for you guys pretty much daily. Um, so Salman went yesterday, and then uh, I went the day before him, and then Paul and Daisuke, and so we're pretty much gonna have one of us streaming every day, probably until the uh, crisis uh, of the corona stuff is over. So lots of learning information from us that we're gonna be you know, trying to give you guys something to do while you're at home um, in your free time and pick up ZBrush and start sculpting. So a quick note on the trial. The trial is available for 30 days, so if you are a student and you need to, you know, follow along with your teachers for seminars or classes, um, you can download the trial and use ZBrush 2020 free, unrestricted, for 30 days. Um, the trial does work on Macintosh, uh, OS X, and Windows. It does not, however, work on any iOS devices, so it will not work on your iPad and it will not work on your iPhone. So just one little note there, I've seen some people that have attempted to download the 2020 trial of ZBrush and get it to run on an iPad. Um, you can use it with Sidecar if you have a computer, uh, a Macintosh computer, you can definitely Sidecar the iPad to ZBrush. But in general, you need to have a iOS machine, uh, not a, um, or a Macintosh machine, OS X machine, and a Windows machine to run it. <laughs> yes, Dark, I, th Dark, I think we're definitely going to be busy for three to four months of uh, streaming information. So hopefully uh, you guys will have a lot of, a lot of knowledge. Yes, yeah, so Chris, the trial is out, so you can go grab it and uh, start messing with ZBrush. All right, another thing I want to hit on before we get into today's topic is we have a bunch of stuff on our YouTube channel too. So if you just do a search for like Pixelogic ZBrush, there's a bunch of learning stuff that's on there. One thing that I contribute pretty much weekly to is the Ask ZBrush system. And so we have the hashtag Ask ZBrush. If you have a question, you can ask it on our Twitter channel. And then weekly I'll go in and look at the questions and try to answer uh, at least try two a week is what I'm trying to hit up with. And so if you have a question that's pretty short and uh, kind of to the point, I can make it in like a five to 10 minute video, give you an answer for it, um, definitely, uh, check these out. So there's a ton of these. So I think I'm up to like 380 videos of this Ask ZBrush stuff. So if you have any questions or you can't find anything, you know, you can definitely tune into one of our streams here on the ZBrush Live channel and ask your questions in the chat and we'll try to answer them for you. But if say you ask a question today and I don't get to it, um, definitely go to YouTube and just do a search for, you know, the keywords that you have in your question. And there's a high probability that there's gonna be a video um, there already that will kind of cover that functionality. Um, so that is what we got here. Another thing I wanna hit on too is you can go to zbrushcentral.com and this is also our uh, community forum as well. And so you can come here and ask questions and also you can see what other artists are doing with ZBrush. So there's a ton of good artwork that's always posted up here. Um, I usually just have this as a home page in my browser. So when I open up my browser to check my emails, this is one of the tabs that opens up. And then I can come in here and see what kind of art's being created in ZBrush. A great source of uh, inspiration. So good stuff there. 
So today I'm going to focus on the Zizu, and the Zizu is a set of mannequin files that ships with ZBrush. So this will be included in the trial if you download the trial. And these were created uh, by Shane Olson for us, and uh, Shane is also a excellent uh, ZBrush artist, and he's one of the streamers on ZBrush Live too. So if you're looking for more information on those, definitely hit up Shane. Now I'm going to go into the basics of ZBrush. So basically if you just installed the trial, this is what you're going to get. And so like, what are the first things you need to do? How do you get to this stage? How do you get to that? And that's the premise of this uh, webinar or this uh, stream today. So it's not going to, if you have like high kind of um, process questions, I'm probably not going to answer those. I may be able to, you know, squeeze in some brief information that will kind of point you in the right direction but the primary stuff that I'm going to be focused on is going to be like the base base level stuff today. So let me just look at these questions here quickly. So we have one question from Brian asking about the differences between ZBrush and ZBrush Core and let me see if I can find this quickly. We have a chart. Find it here. Let's see if I can find it. So here, if you do ZBrush Core and then compare, uh, this will list the kind of differences between the two uh, applications. So ZBrush Core is the light version of ZBrush, so it's got a far lower price point to get into it, um, but it also doesn't have all the you know, insane functionality that the professional version of ZBrush has. But you can go to this chart here at zbrushcore.com um, slash compare, and it'll give you this kind of list of what's in ZBrush Core compared to the professional version of ZBrush. Um, so you can definitely see the differences on those. So that is where you can get that information there. Um, the Anything that you make in ZBrush Core, uh, you can definitely transfer to the professional version and there's also a upgrade path that you can choose. Um, they'll allow you, if you've purchased ZBrush Core, you can get a discount off on the price of the full version if you decide to upgrade that way as well. So you can start with ZBrush Core if you want, try it out. Um, we even have a subscription version of ZBrush Core that is at $9.99 a month. So you can sign up for just a monthly uh, subscription for $10 a month um, for ZBrush Core. Try it out. If you like it, you get a hang of it, you really like using it, um, then you can upgrade to the uh, professional version. So there's lots of ways to get into ZBrush. But out of the gate, you know, if you want to just go in with no cost, just download the trial, you have 30 days to mess with stuff, follow us on the streams here, and hopefully we can get you uh, sculpting in ZBrush. All right, so the first thing we got is if you just launch, say, the trial uh, or of ZBrush, this is what you're going to be greeted with. So it's going to open up, and you're going to have this thing right here that comes across. This is called Lightbox, and this is basically a browser that's inside of ZBrush. And in here, you have a bunch of different files you can start from. So if it's your first time inside a ZBrush, what I recommend doing is make sure Lightbox is open. You can show and hide Lightbox by coming up here and clicking this or pressing comma on your keyboard. And then in here, I'd say select one of these projects. So the last stream we went through, um, we started with one of these Dynamesh spheres here. So this is a great way to just start and get right into ZBrush. You don't have to worry about this edit mode, draw mode, or anything like that. It just gets you right in. And so today we're going to do something similar, but today we're going to start with a mannequin file, and this is part of the Zizu. So I have Lightbox open. I'm in the Project tab here, and then here is the folder for the Zizu. And I'm just going to open this up. And as this opens up, you're going to get a view of all these different animals. So Shane went through and made a ton of these Zizu creatures. And you can use any of these to start sculpting from. Now, what the Lightbox is doing here is it's just showing us the preview of these files. So we kind of get a visual representation of what's going on in these files. And these files all live locally on your directory, um, on your drive. So if you click on one of these, you're going to see the path of where this file is located down here. So all these Zizu projects on your machine will be in the ZBrush 2020.1.1 slash Z projects slash Zizu folder. And then all these files will be in here. Now, these files that are in the Zizus, they are ZPR files, so that's a ZBrush project file. And those just will load in and it's going to set your canvas up nice. You're not going to have this blank space on the side here. You're not going to have this gradient. And they're just going to take you right in and get you right into the sculpting. So I'm going to come through here and I'm going to select one of these creatures. So Shane has a bunch of them in here. 
And you can use any of these to uh, start your you know, sculptures that you want to work on. Um, the thing we're going to hit on today too with these is that they can be modified. So you don't really have to you know, adhere to the exact placement of these models when you open them up. So Shane's made them so they're kind of like a base pose, um, but you can definitely tailor those and we're going to go through those today. So I'm going to locate the gazelle file right here and then to load these in you just need to select it and then just simply double click and this is going to may ask you well it may ask you if you want to save the project so there's no project I've opened now so this is ZBrush did a save a quick save so I'm going to hit no and then just get this loaded in and when this is loaded in this is what you should be greeted with so here I have the gazelle here in the center. I should have a grid and you'll see I have these little floor axis icons here. Now the first thing I want to do is I want to go through quickly the navigation stuff inside of ZBrush and this is maybe one of the first things when you get to ZBrush that you're kind of not really grasping right out the gate and I know for me the zoom process was the big one for me that I just it took me a while to get but then after I got it, it became second nature. So while I demonstrate these things, I have a little keyboard here. I'm going to bring over and place this on my screen. So you can see what buttons I'm pressing while I cover this uh, functionality. Now, if you're just new to ZBrush, uh, you have some different options over here, these little buttons. The ones over here that are zoom, actual, and AA half, these are not going to move your camera uh, in and out of your model. And so oftentimes if you're this is your first time using ZBrush, you may come over here and you may start doing something like this, you know, to kind of move your model into space and you're going to get this grainy kind of pixelated effect. So what these buttons here are doing, these are doing a 2D type zoom. So this is what you have basically with a digital camera and you go in and you do like a digital zoom. So this is taking what you see on screen and it's zooming into the pixels. Like if you had Photoshop and you did like zoomed in. So that's what these buttons are here doing. So they're not doing a 3D zoom, they're doing this 2D zoom. So if you mess with any of these, your model's gonna end up looking you know, a little pixelated or blotchy like this. So to get this back to where it was originally, just come over here and click Actual, and that will return it back to where it is. So if you come over here and accidentally use these to try to zoom in your model or move around your model, um, you can reset that by coming over here and clicking this Actual button. Now the buttons you want to use to move, scale, and rotate are down here. And so if it's your first time using ZBrush, I highly recommend using these buttons first. I'll also cover the uh, canvas navigation here in a second. And so for these, this Zoom 3D will zoom the model in and out, and you see it's actually going to zoom the model. And so to activate this, you just need to click and then just drag, and this will zoom in and out. This pan or move, same thing, so click and then drag, and that will move the model. And then rotate, you can click and drag, and that will rotate around the mesh. So those are the functionalities of those buttons there. Now, in the canvas here, you can also perform these functions, and I use the alt-click navigation. Uh, so there's two different types. Uh, if you watch any Paul's stream, he'll cover the right-click stuff, but I primarily use the alt-click. And so what this is, is that I'm using a tablet like this, and you can use a mouse too, but the mouse is going to have pressure sensitivity, so I highly recommend if you can get a pen device, it's going to make your sculpting process so much better inside of ZBrush. So clicking off the model like this and dragging will rotate the mesh, like so. And then if you hold down the Alt key on your keyboard and then click off the model and drag, that will pan. So these are your pretty much the easy ones. So you can rotate by clicking off and dragging, hold down Alt and click, and that will do a pan. Now the zoom one is a little bit tricky. So if you've just started out, you can still come over here and use this button here but I'll cover the zoom quick. This is the one that for me took a little while to grasp. And so the zoom functionality for the alt click navigation is I'll hold down alt and you click on the canvas. So you can see the keyboard there. You can see I have alt pressed down and I have my mouse one or my pen pressed on the surface. And then I'm going to release the alt key, but I still have the mouse held down. And now I'm moving the mouse or the pen up and down and that is gonna allow me to perform that zoom. So that is how you can zoom with the alt-click navigation. So I'll go through that again. So hold down alt, click and hold down the click, release alt, and then drag. And then that's probably the trickiest thing for the navigation inside of ZBrush, but after you get it, um, you're gonna be able to kind of navigate around your model really freely and it just, it, it will click, I promise you. It will click and you'll be able to navigate around. 
Now, one more thing with the rotation, if you click off and rotate like this, if you hold down shift while you're performing this rotation, this is going to allow you to snap into front, back, and side views of your model. So I'm just clicking, dragging, and then hold down shift, and that's gonna snap it down. So I'm using a uh, no board, I think that's what it's called, <laughs> for uh, showing the thing, and then, uh, yeah, no board, and then I'm using on top replica for the keyboard. So we had a question about what I was using to display the keyboard, so no board, and then on top replica. So those are the two. So <clears throat> next thing I wanna get into is kinda how to switch in and out of perspective. So this is another thing, especially if you're sculpting on something, so you can see, I can turn the side here. I'm in perspective right now, so you can see I'm kind of seeing the two versions of the knees there, I'm seeing both the feet. But sometimes you may want to get into a position on your sculpt and see it entirely in orthographic. And this is going to help you like just look at the silhouette primarily and kind of figure out or feel how that shape's going to work. So you can come over here and there's a perspective button, and you can also press key on your keyboard to, uh, P on your keyboard to toggle this as well. And this will just toggle perspective on and off. So if you want it on or you want it off. And then below this, we have the floor grid. So the floor grid will allow you to see where the floor of the mesh is, and it's gonna travel where your model goes. So if I move this model up, that floor grid's gonna follow it, unless I change some settings later. But sometimes you may not want the floor as well, so you can just turn that off too, and then you're gonna be left with your model with no floor, and then I can put it in orthographic or perspective. Now, the last time we talked about the orthographic or perspective mode inside of ZBrush, uh, we had some questions of, well, which mode should I sculpt in? So it really doesn't matter. Um, it just depends on what you're trying to do. Like if I'm definitely want to, you know, tailor the silhouette of my gazelle here, I want to be out of perspective. Um, so that way I can kind of easily see that perfect outline. Um, also, if you're doing toys or collectibles, oftentimes you want to stay out of perspective um, just to kind of get a clean version of your model. Because the perspective on a computer is always going to be, you know, not quite real world. Now, if you activate perspective, we do have some different, uh, ways you can contribute or change your focal lengths and your distances. So we have a camera inside of ZBrush you can change. So right now I'm at 50 millimeters, so I can change it to 35, 28. So you can definitely use the camera inside of ZBrush with perspective to line up images and things like that to get you know a closer feel to representation. So if you're trying to do a likeness, if you know what the focal length of that photo was that was taken of the person you're trying to sculpt, um, it'll definitely help if you set the uh, camera view there too. So little things there for that. All right. <clears throat> so now that I've got the Zizu Gazelle here loaded in, um, we can now talk about how you can kind of reposition these. So Shane went through and made all these base creatures, and as he created them, they're all in nice, Symmetri symmetrical forms. So we've got this area here, we've got the side area here, and they're all nice and symmetrical. So with this, you may not want to model your gazelle completely in a static pose. You may want to make him look like he's running, make him look like he's jumping. And there's some crazy images of uh, gazelles if you look online. So let's see if I can pull this up quick. Where is it at? Actually, I'll show it in a minute. But <laughs> there's, there's one I've got, and it's, he's like standing up and he's got his legs bent all crazy. So definitely not gazelles aren't always going to be in this static form. So what we can do is we can modify these mannequins. And basically, as I recommend as a new user ZBrush, just load a base one and then you can just start playing with it and get a feel for it. And then we'll turn this into a sculptural asset and then we can come in and start detailing it. So up here at the top, we have draw, move, scale, and rotate. And these are our different modes that we can use inside of ZBrush. So if we have a mannequin file like this, which is what the gazelle here is, we don't really don't really want to be in draw mode at this moment. So we want to be in move, scale, or rotate. Um, you can also toggle these with the hotkeys of W, E, and R. And if you hover over any icons inside of ZBrush, you'll get a little help text that's going to pop up, and this will display hotkeys if they're associated with them. If you want more information on what each of the buttons does, you can hold down control while you're hovering over a button, and this will give you some extra help text. So another good way to come through and see you know, what different things do, and these will give you little examples and sometimes images that correlate to each of these buttons. So if you come across a button in ZBrush and you're like, I don't really know what that does, um, you can definitely hover over it, and as you're hovering over it, hold down the control key, and it'll give you some information on it. 
And additional to things inside of uh, information on processes or buttons inside of ZBrush, we also have this little help area up the top here, and you can search the online docs. And so if you have a button and maybe the help text has some information, like here, perspective will tell you a little bit about perspective here, but say you want more on it, you can definitely go to the help search online docs and then type in perspective and you'll get some more information and some probably some tutorials will go along with it. All right, so one question we had about draw mode. So draw mode is gonna be how you're sculpting. When you're sculpting on a mesh, you're gonna be in draw mode. And draw mode is gonna allow you to activate brushes, and then you can use those brushes to sculpt details on your models. When you're in move, scale, and rotate, if you are not in a mannequin, you're gonna get this thing called the Gizmo 3D, which I'll show you here in a minute. And then you can use that to move around and change your mesh on the fly. But if you have a mannequin file like so, like the gazelle here, when you switch to move, scale, and rotate, you're not gonna get anything other than this uh, cursor like so. So with this cursor, I'm gonna press spacebar here to get this little pop-up menu here, and there's a draw size slider here. I'm gonna just scale my draw size down. You can also come up here and change your draw size, or you can even press S and change your draw size too, or you can use the brackets. So you have multiple ways to change your draw size inside of ZBrush. Now I'm gonna make it my draw size is just a little bit smaller, and as I hover over the gazelle here, you're gonna see I'm gonna get these little circles that are gonna be generated around my mesh. So the gazelle here is made up of a thing called Z-spheres, and Z-spheres are basically spheres that you can use to create different shapes or forms quickly inside a ZBrush, and they're linked together in this hierarchy uh, structure. So if I come across the Z-sphere on the leg here and click and drag, I'm able to move this, okay? So I can move this up and down like so. And then if I come above it, right to like the link between this Z-sphere and this V-sphere, I can then move the whole leg. So you can end up coming through and start manipulating the gazelle here, right? And currently I have symmetry on, so as I come through here and do this, I'm gonna be able to manipulate the entire part of the gazelle. So I can move the neck, come up here, maybe rotate a little bit more, and change its ears move his nose, make it really long. So you have like a lot of customization you can do with these mannequin files. Now, if you make a change you don't like inside of ZBrush here, so say I did something crazy like this, you can see some of his ears are going with it. Now I've got, you know, a thing from Abe's Odyssey. Um, let's say you don't want that. You can press uh, Control plus Z on your keyboard and that will undo. You can also press Control, Shift, and Z to redo. So you can undo and redo any changes you do inside of ZBrush. And these will also be stored on this undo history bar that's at the top here. And you can use this as well to scroll through those different undo stages. So if you want the Abe's Odyssey effect, you can do that. If you want to go back to your gazelle, you can just undo. So with the gazelle here, I want to just manipulate him some, maybe change some different things, give him a longer tail. So make sure I'm still in move here. I'm going to come across the nub on his tail here and grow that down. And then I can come to the next one and move that a little bit to make it a little bit larger. I may want his knees to be a little more bent. And then maybe want his toes to be, you know, eh, he's got hooves. May want this one to be a little bit pointier too. And for the toes, I'm going to come through and turn back on my floor grid just so I can see the floor here. So you can see I manipulated this one and this toe is touching the ground, but this one currently is floating. So I want to elongate the toe here to make this one touch the ground too. So I'm just going to move it and get it into position there. And then maybe move his ankle up. This is going to be the crazy gazelle. Do some, something like that. And then maybe move this up a little bit. So just modifying the form on him some. Now I can also switch to rotate at this stage and rotate the different parts as two. So I've been moving using the move option here. So I can switch to rotate and this will perform a rotation off the Z spheres. And this isn't gonna allow me to stretch or move them. So when I was in move, I could change the length, right? So I could come through and I could change how long I wanted this leg, how short I wanted the leg. If I go to rotate and use rotate now, you can see I'm not going to be able to change that link. So it's gonna hold it in place and then I can just rotate the parts. So if I wanna change his leg to do something that isn't plausible, I can definitely do that. I can undo to get it back. If I wanna change his neck, you can see now his neck is moving correctly and it's not moving or changing those other parts. So you have a lot of different things. So now I can be, you know, drinking water, maybe he's looking up really high, maybe he's like, you know, doing some crazy running. And look, you can make him 
He goes really fast. Really fast. So all sorts of things you can do with the mannequins just by changing to move and uh, rotate there and come through and adjusting your mesh. Now, if you want to move the entire Z uh, mannequin model here, Z sphere mannequin model, you need to find the root Z sphere, and that will be the one that will have the coloring. It's going to have a two tone coloring like this. And so, if you think about, if you ever do any, did any type of animation or stuff, you always have like a root bone, and that root bone everything else connects to, and you can remove the root bone around, and then everything else is going to follow. So, the Z sphere mannequin stuff is set up very similar in that kind of approach. So, it has one z-sphere that's part of this mannequin here and it's the one that's always going to be two-toned and this one is what's driving the rest of the model so if you want to reposition your mannequin here what you can do is just hover over that z-sphere there and you want to hold down the alt key while you're in move mode and then if you click and drag oh, let's see the control key not the alt key so hover over the root z-sphere hold down control make sure you're in move mode and then click and drag and you'll be able to reposition the mannequin. And so what you can end up doing after you get accustomed to using mannequins is you can go through and you can start appending more mannequins to your scene and then positioning them around. And I could have a whole forest of gazelles uh, posed in different ways and doing different things. Now if you want to rotate uh, a mannequin model, you need to do the, use the deformation palette. And this is located in the tool deformation area here. In here you can also do the offset as well, but the rotation one will allow you to rotate the mannequin. Uh, you will have to figure out which angle you're going to rotate the mannequin at. So by default, this will be in the Y angle. So you'll use these little icons over here next to the rotate button. And these are going to determine which angle or axis the model is going to rotate. So currently it was set at Z, so it was rotating around this axis here. And so I want to change it from Z to Y. So you can just click on these and I'll turn them on and off. And now if I rotate, I'll be able to rotate the gazelle around. So that's how you can reposition and also rotate a mannequin model. Now, after you have your mannequin, let's say you maybe don't want them in symmetry, you can also turn off symmetry and reposition them like that as well. So to turn off symmetry, you can come to the transform palette and there's a activate symmetry button here. If you hover over this, you'll see that the hotkey is X for this on your keyboard. So you can toggle symmetry on and off just by clicking X on your keyboard. Now, when it's off, you'll see that I'm only gonna have one kind of cursor on my model. If I turn it on, you're gonna see I'm gonna get a corresponding little white box that's serving on the other side. So this way you get a visual representation if symmetry is on or if it's off. And so if it's on, you're gonna see this little pip on the other side, and then if I turn it off, I'm only see one. And so with it off, I could come through and say rotate one leg different from the other and change it like so. For this uh, demonstration, I'm going to just keep it symmetry for now. And so just keep them as a T-pose here so I can easily come in and sculpt on them and sculpt across both sides easily. But you can also use uh, the mannequin files or the z-spheres uh, without symmetry as well if you want to do some more dynamic posing. So now that you have your mannequin and you have changed some of his proportions, maybe changed some of his styling, maybe made his neck really long, made his nose really long, changed his ears, anything your heart desired, um, we now need to take this and turn it into a mesh that we can sculpt on. And so this right now is just basically setting up our base mesh or our you know, generic model so we can get the forms, we can get, you know, the different, you know, um, structures, silhouettes, things that we like. And then after we're happy with that, we now take it to the next step, which is the sculpting. So to do this, we're just going to go to the tool palette over here and we need to locate the adaptive skin area and open this up. And in here, there's this button called preview. And you'll see if you hover over this, it's going to be linked to the hot key A. And also if you hold down control, you can get a little bit of information on that too. Now, if you hit A, what ZBrush is going to do? It's going to take the mannequin that we have here, and it's going to convert it to a mesh that's going to be based around that mannequin. So if I come over here and hit A, you see it's going to change the coloring on my model here, and it's no longer looking like that Z-sphere mannequin form. So I don't have that two-tone happening. I don't have anything else. And at this stage, this mesh is geometry. So if I turn on my polyframes here, you can see that it is consisting of now triangles and quads across the surface. Now, one thing you'll notice by default, if you use any of the Zizu models and just activate preview, that all these parts are still segmented. So basically every single part that the Z sphere mannequin had is going to be like a separate geometry island. So it's basically taking like, say like 
of one part and then another part's just like stuck inside of it. So it's all intersecting geometry. Now there are ways that you can convert this to a solid mesh and you start sculpting on it. Um, and you can do that after the make adaptive skin process. But you can also do it before by just changing one of the sliders over here. And so if it's your first time using ZBrush and um, you're using the mannequins here from the Zizu, I'd highly recommend using this process I'm about to show. So I'm going to hit A again to get out of preview, and this is going to bring me back to my mannequin Zsphere file here. And directly below the preview button, there is a DynaMesh resolution slider. And what DynaMesh is, DynaMesh is a way that you can take a model and you can fill it with geometry, and it's going to give you even geometry across the entire mesh. And this is going to be triangles and quads, but all the size of every of those, all the sizes of those polys are all going to be pretty much even. So it's going to give you this even surface. So if you sculpt on one part of your model to another part of your model, you're going to get a consistent stroke all the way across. Now the resolution value that you put in is going to determine how much topology it's going to throw at your mesh when it generates this result. And so if you set a really low amount, so let's say I set 128 and then hit enter, and now activate the preview by clicking this button or pressing A, you're going to see I'm going to get a low res result. So you can see I got some of the detail in the silhouette from the gazelle there, but I didn't get everything. And this is because my resolution was set a little bit too low. So I can press A again to get out of preview, and then down here I can increase this. Now a good number if you're just starting out is usually 512. So you can do 512 and then now press preview, and now you're gonna get this result. So as you can see, now I have most of the forms for the gazelle here. I still see some of the detailing from the original Z-Sphere mannequin, but that's okay because we can clean that up. But now the mesh is ready to be sculpted on. Now at this stage, I could come to draw and I could start sculpting, but I'm still in just this preview mode. So if I came through and started making marks on this mesh and then accidentally come over here and click preview, I'm gonna get a little warning that's gonna pop up. And it's basically telling me that, hey, um, this was just a Z-Sphere preview. It's not really a mesh to sculpt on. Do you want to stay in this mode or do you want to discard the changes? Now, if you click discard changes, it's going to remove all your sculpting at this stage. So be careful when you're using preview that you remember that you're in a preview mode and not in the converted poly mesh mode. So I'm going to hit no just to show you what will happen here. So if I hit no, I'm going to go back to the Z-Spheres. And then if I go back to preview, you're going to see that sculpting is going to be gone. So just be a little careful there. When you're using preview, make sure that if you're in the preview mode that you're not sculpting on your mesh yet. So now after you have the preview mode, mode activated, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna come down here, I'm gonna click this Make Adaptive Skin. So this button right here. And when you click Make Adaptive Skin, it's gonna take what I see in this preview mode and it's gonna make a new tool file out of it. And then this file is gonna be set up for sculpting. So I'm going to come over here, click Make Adaptive. And this is going to now generate a file up here that's going to have the word skin appended to the front of it. So you can see I have a Skin Gazelle Z-Spheres. And then this was the one I currently have selected, which is the Z-Sphere version. So this is making a non-destructive process. So it's leaving me with a file that is the Z-Sphere version that I was playing with, or the Mannequin Zizu version. And then when I click this and make, make Adaptive Skin, it's now generated a new file up at the top. And so if I select that, you can see here I have my gazelle. And if I turn on my polyframes here, you can see it consists of all that topology. And at this stage, using this process of that DynaMesh and then making the adaptive skin, it's no longer giving me that intersecting geometry. This mesh is now, everything's together. And so it's one single solid watertight form. So now that I have this, it's probably a good time to save. And the ways to save inside ZBrush if you're a first time uh, user of it is I recommend just coming up here and clicking quick save. This is gonna be the easiest way to do it and I'll show you where you can find your files. So I'm gonna come up here and just click quick save. And when you click quick save, it's going to save a project file. And a project file can also manually be saved by going to the file menu over here and clicking save as. Now, when you save a project inside of ZBrush, it's going to save everything. So if I come over here to the tool palette, you see I had that Z-Sphere and also the skin. So I had two tools in my, my scene here. Now, when I save a project, both of these files are going to be saved. So they're going to be saved out, and so when I open this file again, they're both going to be there. Now, if I just came over here and used the Save As for Tool, what's going to happen now? It's only going to save the tool that I have selected. So it's not going to save this other Z-Sphere gazelle right here. 
So as a learner, it's learning out starting ZBrush, I highly recommend using the quick save option or going to file and doing save as rather than coming over here and saving a tool. Now, once I have this ready to be sculpted on, I can now switch to a brush. And so this is where we switch to our draw mode. So before we were in move, scale, and rotate when we were messing with our mannequins. So if I click move, you're gonna see now I'm gonna get this gizmo 3D option. So when I come through these, I have now a manipulator. So I'm no longer getting that little circle that I had for positioning. So this is because I've converted the model from a mannequin or a z-sphere model to now a mesh. And so when I did that make adaptive skip process, it changed the type of that file. And with this now, if I switch to move, scale, and rotate, you're gonna see I'm not gonna be able to repose the gazelle. So you wanna make sure that you get all your posing done in the z-sphere one. When you're happy with it, convert it, and then now you can start sculpting on it. Now later on, you could go through when you get more into ZBrush and you could break the legs off, you could reposition them, you can use masking. There's all sorts of ways you can kind of adjust the pose after it's done. But the starting pose, when you start out, the easiest way to pose is just basically use that mannequin, go in there, pose the model where you want it. When you're happy with it, just convert to a mesh and go from there. So I'm gonna switch back to draw here and now we're gonna briefly touch on the brush functionality. And with the brushes inside of ZBrush, the most basic thing you can do is just sculpt. And so there's a lot of bells and whistles in here. Just even going to the Zizu and messing with the mannequins and converting to an adaptive skin is already like a lot of information to take in. Um, so when you get to the sculpting stage, you know, just, just think of it as if you had a ball of clay or a ball of, say, Play-Doh, and you're just pushing and pulling the surface. And that's all the basics of ZBrush is, is this pushing and pulling of the surface to create forms and details. And how I like to kind of present it is that it can be very simplistic and you can still reach really nice results. So to sculpt on a mesh, basically just, we're gonna have the standard brush here selected, which is just the default brush. We're in this draw mode right here. And I just have my pen tablet like so. And when to sculpt, I just need to come across the mesh and click and drag. And as you click and drag, it's going to perform a positive sculpt on your mesh. So what this is doing is ZBrush is looking at the model geometry and it's taking it and wherever you sculpt across, it's pulling the vertices up, pulling them up to make that form. So this is all you need to do to initially start sculpting with ZBrush. So I'm just pulling across the surface and you can see over here, it's just a click and drag, click and drag, and that's your positive sculpt. Now, if I don't like what I did, I can always undo, get back to where I was. Now to carve into a mesh, all you need to do is hold down the Alt key and then click and drag. So if I just click and drag, I'm gonna do a positive stroke. Holding down Alt, clicking and dragging is gonna carve in. And those are gonna be your two base principles for sculpting inside a ZBrush. Generating a positive, carving into the surface. And those two are gonna allow you to get all the sorts of stuff you need inside a ZBrush. Now the third one, third option for using your brush is holding down the Shift key. And you'll see when you hold down the shift key, this brush icon over here is gonna shift. So it now says smooth. If I release shift, it says standard, which is the standard brush. If I hold down shift, it's now smooth. Now when I have the smooth brush, what this is going to do, it's going to relax or even the topology of the surface out. So if I hold down shift and come across the model here, I'm now gonna smooth this area out. And so I can come through and now start removing those areas that, those lines that were being generated from the initial uh, Z-sphere. Now you want to also make sure you're probably in symmetry this stage, so I'm going to hit X and you'll see when I have X symmetry active there, you can see I'm getting that little line on the other side. So now when I'm performing the smooth by holding down shift, it's smoothing across the other side. So I come through and quickly just smooth out all those areas there. Now the final option for using a brush is holding down control. And when you hold down control, you're gonna see the brush is gonna switch again. So it's gonna switch from that standard to now a mask pen. And the mask pen is gonna allow you to protect areas from the sculptural stuff you're doing. So if I come here and hold control and click, I'm now gonna get a mask. And now if I just click and drag, you'll see as I sculpt across this mask, it's only gonna affect the areas that are unmasked. So this will allow you to come through and protect areas on your model, and then you can come through and sculpt around them. Um, if you want to clear the mask, you can come and just hold control to get that mask pen again. Just click and drag off your model in a blank spot like this, and then release, and that's gonna clear your mask. So holding down control and clicking will give you the mask, and that's gonna protect that surface from any sculptural marks. To clear it, hold control and click off like so.
If you want to invert the mask after you have it, so say I want this part to be unmasked and everything else to be masked, you can hold down control and just click in a blank spot of your canvas and that's gonna invert your mask. So holding control and clicking will invert and then holding control and dragging will clear. And those are your basic premises, uh, <laughs> principles of the mask pen. So those are your pretty much all you need basically to sculpt anything inside ZBrush. So click and drag will add, alt click and drag will carve in, shift and drag will smooth, and control and drag will mask. And those are gonna be your basic principles there. So let me get some water here quick and then I'm gonna look at these questions. All right. <clears throat> So, we have one question from Moonlighting asking, how am I rotating the model as I sculpt on it? So I'm clicking off, and you can see as I click off, I'm rotating. So maybe the, the stream here may be doing a little bit of craziness, but basically I'll fast click sometimes to just rotate the mesh a little bit, and then I'll come through and sculpt, and then just you know rotate like so. So it's kind of like, <laughs> if you ever seen a squirrel running around, or a, a bird, you know, that kind of like little twitchy effect. So sometimes I do like that. So <laughs> that's probably what was happening there. But as I'm sculpting on the model, it, it will not be rotating. Now, if you come off of it, even to the end there, that's when that rotation is going to happen. So it's probably just me clicking off and dragging. And then I am using the alt zoom functionality to kind of zoom in and out. Um, if you're new to ZBrush as well, this will do the same thing. So I recommend if you can't get the alt click working right out the gates, um, this will give you that same functionality. All right, so now I'm gonna come in and I'm gonna start detailing my gazelle out here. I'm gonna turn off my floor. And I'm gonna smooth out these little areas through here. Now, as we just talked about, the main principles are very, very uh, simplistic. And ZBrush has a ton of bells and whistles, whistles but you really don't have to um, use all of them. Like, you can just get in and just do the basis of sculpting, and that's just, you know, I'm using the smooth brush here to kind of smooth out my surface. And then I'm gonna to change to a different brush here other than standard, and then I'm gonna just come in and start adding some more elements. So I'm just smoothing out some of these Z-sphere areas here. There's some other ways you can do this as well. So in the deformation palette over here, you have some polish options too, and these will allow you to come in and apply that kind of process globally. So if you wanna do it all in one huge kind of swoop, you can come over here and use some of these deformation options and they'll affect the entire mesh. Um, these will also respect masking, so you can mask off portions and only do it to certain parts. So we're going to just apply some of that smoothing there. Now the brushes inside of ZBrush, there is a bunch that ship with ZBrush, and these live over here in the brush palette, and that's this little icon over here. Now when you click on this, it's going to open up a menu here. Let me move my keyboard right there. And in here we have a bunch of different brush presets that are loaded in ZBrush. Now, this may look a little bit daunting, especially if you're a new user inside of ZBrush. Um, the main brushes that I'll cover are pretty much the ones I use. I use about like five brushes, and these can get you, you know, pretty much everywhere you want to go. There's a lot of brushes in here that will give you more functionality down the line, and they will help speed up your pipelines and processes. But in general, you know, if you think about how you sculpt something with the clay, you're pretty much using like just a few tools, and that's the same functionality inside of ZBrush. So using a few things, and you can still get the result you're looking for. So the standard brush is the one that ZBrush is gonna start with, and this is going to give you that stroke or that sculptural mark that's gonna have this rounded type effect. So this is good for kind of muscle forms. It's also very a soft kind of blending uh, brush. So you can come in and just kind of nicely add like a little height to elements, and it's always gonna have this fall off around the edges. Now, one brush that I like to use, that's pretty much my go-to, is the clay buildup brush. So if I go to my brush palette here and open this up, you can see that we have a bunch of brushes. They're in alphabetical order for the most part. And the clay buildup brush lives right here. But you may not be able to find it because there's so many in here. So one thing nice about the brush system side of ZBrush is there's this unique hotkey method in which you can use to select brushes. And you basically just have to remember a few letters. So the first letter you need to remember is the hotkey B. And so when you click B, it's going to open that brush palette. And let me move this up. And here I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hide some stuff so you guys can... I got too many, too many little titles here. Kyle's going to get mad at me. Turn off his little 
these little slideshows here. And my camera's going away for a minute. And we're gonna we're gonna kill my uh, my title too. All right. So when you hit B on your keyboard, this is gonna open up the brush palette. So here we have the brush palette here. Now the next thing we can do is we can hit another hotkey in association with this. And the second hotkey we're gonna hit is the letter of the brush we're looking for. So I know I wanna find the clay buildup brush and the clay buildup brush begins with the letter C. So I first hit B to open up this menu and now I'm gonna hit C on my keyboard. Now when I hit C on my keyboard, it's only gonna show me the brushes that begin with the letter C. So you can see now I've isolated all those other brushes out of this list here and I can focus on a smaller amount. Now the next thing you'll notice after I hit that second hotkey is that each of these brushes is gonna have a letter next to it. And this letter is going to allow you to press that and then that is going to select that brush. So I've hit B the first time, which has brought up this window. I hit C to isolate by the letter C. And then if I click B, which is the letter that's next to this clay buildup brush, that is now going to select the clay buildup brush, right? So now I have clay buildup. So let's hit, do that process again, but this time let's select that standard brush. So I'm gonna hit B on my keyboard, to open up the window here. I know standard brush starts with S, so I'm gonna hit S. And then you'll see I'm just isolated by the letter S, so all the brushes that begin with S. And you'll see the standard brush has a hot key of T. So now if I hit T on my keyboard, I now have the standard brush. So let's go back to clay buildup, which was B, C, B. So B, C, B, I got clay buildup. Let's go back to standard, B, S, T. And then that's pretty much all you need to do for the hotkeys for the brushes. Now for the ones I end up using normally, I use the clay buildup brush, the standard brush. There's also a dam standard brush, which is B, D, S. I also use the move brush, which is B, M, V. And then I'll use the snake hook brush, which is B, S, H. And those are pretty much my go-tos. Um, also the pinch brush, B, P, I. And then inflate, B, I, N. So those are the, <laughs> the number of hotkeys that live in my head <laughs> at a given moment. Now, after you've selected a brush um, by coming up here and clicking it, you'll see that it's also going to store that up here on this very top bar. So if you've gone through and manually selected a brush and then you've gone through and selected them, they're gonna show up at the top here. So the brushes I went through, I had the clay buildup brush, then the dam standard brush, the inflate brush, the move brush, the pinch brush, the snake hook brush, and the standard brush. And those are usually my primarily go-tos for if I'm doing any sculpting. And I primarily stick with the clay buildup brush most of the time as I'm sculpting meshes. So I'm just going to select the clay build up brush here, and now I have that selected, and now let's turn back on all my things so Kyle doesn't get mad at me. Let's find my, find my mouse here. There we go. Oh, not that one. There we go. I'm back. Okay. So now that I have the clay buildup brush selected, and we were talking about the differences in brushes, so standard was giving us that nice smooth form. Now I'm changing my draw size here and I'm doing it with spacebar. Now if you use spacebar, it's going to pretty much always put you on this draw size slider. There's also a bunch of different options through here. You can choose, you know, different materials, you can change different settings, but pretty much the draw size is where I go to and spacebar is just where my habit of my thumb goes to when I'm using it. Now, if you position this down low on the end of your screen, you press spacebar, you may not end up going to that draw size slider. So just one little thing to note, if you're using spacebar to go to draw size, it will be dependent on where this pops up. So if you're above pretty much the middle screen, you're gonna be good, you're gonna fall right on that draw size slider. But if you're down low, it's gonna be down here. Now, the other thing with this is you can also just use S on your hotkey and that's gonna come through and allow you to bring up the draw slider, uh, draw slider like this, and then you can change your draw size here. You can also change it up here, and then you can also use the brackets, which are left and right. So I'm gonna just decrease my draw size just a little bit, and now I'm gonna start sculpting on the mesh here. Now, with this, I just come across the surface and click and drag, and I just like to build up forms and kind of shapes. So I do it kind of quick and go through and just pull out different areas like this. And as I'm doing this, I kind of do this cross hatching type effect too, where I'm going back and forth to kind of bring it up. And then I'll come back in with smooth, so holding down shift to kind of smooth it out. 
and I'll change my draw size and just go through. Let's give this guy a little snoot like that. And then I can kind of find where I want that eye. And you'll see when this is happening, I'm just pressing spacebar quickly to get the draw size to change. Let's see if I can switch to, see my brain will let me switch to um, using the brackets. And so all I'm doing at this stage is I'm just finding forms and then carving in and out. So I'm either holding alt to kind of cut into an area or just clicking and dragging to add to the area. And you can see just doing this, you can see I can start describing these different elements. Now, one thing you'll notice when I'm doing this by default is you're going to see that my stroke quality is getting a little bit strange, right? So if I come here and do this, I'm getting these stair steps that are happening along my mesh. And this is going to be based on the resolution of the model. So if I turn on my polyframes here, you're going to see that I can see all the little polygons and triangles that make up the mesh. And as I sculpt across here, the size of these are you know, not small enough to get the de all the details I want. So if I wanted to come in and make a really small cut, you see it's not going to be very clean through there. So there's a bunch of different ways you can do this and set, fix this inside of ZBrush. You could add more geometry to your model by applying this thing called a subdivision. Um, you could also redynamize your model. We talked about that resolution before. And we could increase that resolution to give us more polygons across the entire mesh. However, instead of doing either of those, what I recommend doing is coming up here and activating Sculptress Pro. And if you come across and activate Sculptress Pro mode, this is going to enable a dynamic brush tessellation system. Now, I know that sounds like a lot, um, but what this is going to do, it's going to now, ZBrush is going to analyze when you perform a sculptural mark on your mesh, and it's going to add topology if it's needed, or it's going to remove topology if it's not needed. So let's come across this neck here of our gazelle, and we're going to turn Sculptress Pro off, and let's just make that line once like we had it without it. So this is the result I was getting through there. Now let's turn it on, and let's do that same thing you're gonna see the difference in clarity I'm getting. So this one is holding up a bunch more better. Like I'm not getting this stair stepping that's happening and it's going all the way through. Yeah, you can definitely ask questions. I may not, <laughs> I'll try to answer them, um, but I may not get all of them. I do, look at, I do attempt to look at the chat every once in a while. And so you can see the amount of quality I'm getting now when I perform that stroke. And if I turn on my polyframes, you're going to see the difference here. So this is the initial stroke without Sculptress Pro. And all it was doing was pushing and pulling those vertices. So it's pushing and pulling all these little points that are connected to the edge of each of those polygons or triangles. And so as this pushes and pulls these, that's all it's doing to give me that sculptural detail. Now, when I have Sculptress Pro turned on, what it's doing is as I create this stroke, ZBrush is going, hey, you're going to need more resolution to get that stroke to look nice. So it's going to actually add it. So you can see as I do this process here, it's adding geometry to that specific area. And this is going to allow you to get a nice, clear result across your mesh. Now, if I smooth, this is going to do kind of the opposite thing as well. So I can use the smooth to add topology too. So if I come across this area and just smooth, you can see it's going to add geometry just in that area by smoothing. Now, the size of these topology or the clarity is going to be based on your draw size. So if I come in with a larger draw size and come across the mesh, you're going to see it's not going to give me as much density or detail as if I went in with a smaller one. So this mode is smart. So it's going to know, hey, if you have a large brush, you really don't need all that geometry to give, me, give you the result. But if you have a small brush, it's going to go, hey, you're going to need a lot of geometry to get that result. So keeping Sculptors Pro on initially as you're sculpting is going to be a huge time saver uh, for you. And I pretty much just leave this on now if I do any sculpting. Because you're going to see if I undo these, if I hit Control Z and getting out of here. And let's go sculpt on the face of my gazelle again. You're going to see as I do this, now I'm getting a nice clean stroke through here. And I'm getting a lot more detail out of it. So now I'm getting the brush stroke from that alpha from this clay buildup brush. Now if I turn this off, this is what I was getting. So I highly recommend to turn that on and use this while you're initially sculpting. Now with this you can smooth as well. We talked about the smoothing, so I can smooth this out and you'll see if I do, ooh, why am I not plugged in? Hold on, hold on, this may be why I'm blurry. 
Give me one sec. <laughs> That's a new one. <laughs> I don't think I've ever done that before. All right, <laughs> so let me know if that's better. We'll, we'll, we'll try next time to plug stuff in. I got most of my stuff in. <laughs> there we go. Let's see, let's see if that looks any better. I apologize for that. All right, so I usually come in and I'll just sculpt you know, large sections of my model here and use this to come through and get those details kind of fleshed out. And I go in pretty rough with the Sculptor's Pro mode. So kind of coming in, because I can always smooth it back out. I can always you know, erase it, I can always undo. So it's, it's very forgiving if you make any mistakes. And you don't have to worry about anything other than sculpting. Now, when you're doing this, uh, you can also remove parts as well. So let's say these horns are a little bit too big. And so I can get the, a larger brush size through here and if I hit shift to get the smooth brush and I have Sculptors Proactive, I can actually smooth away stuff as well. So I can come through and you know, smooth that horns down so they're not so long. I could even come through and cut out the middle parts. So I can start smoothing this and I can actually separate them too. And so Sculptors Pro is really nice for coming in and just changing your model. So I don't want these ears on the gazelle right now. So I'm gonna smooth these out. Take those all the way down. So he's an earless gazelle. And then I'm gonna just smooth the eyes out some too. And just start getting a little bit different results out of this. And a lot of this is just comes down to practice. So if you're you know, using ZBrush for the first time, it is gonna be a little bit difficult. And um, the base premise is the more you do it, the better you're gonna get at it. And I talked about this in the last stream. Uh, what I recommend doing is just sculpting for say 15 minutes a day and just play with the brushes, get used to how things are handling, um, just how things work. And then, you know, after like a few days of doing these little 15 minute sculpt sessions, you're gonna get a lot faster, you're gonna get a lot quicker and your models are gonna start looking better. So I highly recommend, you know, doing that kind of stuff on a daily basis. And another thing about doing artwork as well, when you start sculpting something, um, I generally lose track of time. So if I set myself up for a 15 minute a day type thing, then it may be like hours later, um, I'll actually stop <laughs> or notice where the time went. So oftentimes, you know, just starting will end up getting you in the mood to actually do some sculptural stuff. And then you can go in and I start getting into like a Bob Ross happy flower voice. It's calming. And so I'm just adding some different uh, forms on my gazelle here. And this is all I'm doing. I'm just, you can see what my keyboard's doing. I'm just clicking and dragging and then I'll hold Alt and erase. And I just do that process and that's it. That's, there's nothing hard to this. I'm rotating around. I don't want this to be that thick and break it back out. And this is all with that Sculptress Pro mode on, so I don't have to worry about any topology at this stage. Change my brush size. And I just start playing with the forms. So let's look at these questions here quick. So Maestro is asking, add a lot of height or depth to a model that starts artifacting or showing clipping. So that is probably related to um, how much, so if you have your model and you push and pull the surface a lot. So if I get out of say Sculptures Pro here, and let's say I come in and I'm just gonna just go crazy with this, right? So I went through and I applied a bunch of that clay buildup to this area. And you'll see what happened here. So this was without Sculptures Pro, is that eventually I reached this kind of issue where stuff's like going inside out and it's making a little mess here. Now if I turn on my polyframes and you see the geometry here, what was happening is without Sculptors Pro on and just the clay buildup is that I took some of these polygons and these triangles and I stretched them way too much. And so as they're stretching, 
the brush is still stretching them and then they're starting to do this little cross thing and you're starting to get this messy mesh. So if you come out of Maldo like too fast sometimes, it'll end up giving you this. Now there are certain brushes that are better than others for doing this. Like you can see the clay buildup brush, you probably wouldn't want to do this because it's going to keep building up on top of each other for each different stroke. And if you don't have enough topology to support it, you're going to end up getting this kind of stretching effect. Now, if I do the same process with Sculptress Pro, this is going to work a little bit better and see, but I'm still going to get that kind of pinnacle at some point where I'm going to get start getting these little kind of jaggies through here. Now, one thing nice about Sculptress Pro is you can hold shift and smooth that stuff out and it's going to actually remove it and take it away. Now, there is an occasion where you can get sometimes holes in your meshes, uh, especially if you use a lot of, you know, very high intensity strokes across your model. Uh, to fix these, we can apply a close holes function. And to do this, we can go to the tool palette over here. We can run up the geometry area. And then we go to modify topology, and there's a uh, close holes option here. So if you're using Sculptors Pro and you end up, you know, getting some of that craziness or maybe end up generating a hole in your mesh, um, you can come over to the tool geometry modify topology and do a close holes and that will close that out. Now as you're working too, the ZBrush will go through and it will auto save and it will do this about every 15 minutes. Um, you can also uh, actually do the quick save anytime you want. So it's often good to come up here, you can mind remembers it uh, and just quick save out every once in a while. And this will make sure that file is going to get saved. So I have a question about the tire background. So the, the tire is going to be not, it's going to be next Friday. Next Friday I'll be doing the tire, so I'll be going over the Z Modeler brush. And we'll handle it the same way as we're doing this one, so it's going to be like the base starting out of what is Z Modeler, how to use Z Modeler, and we'll be making a tire for that. So that will be on whatever next Friday is. I don't remember the day. Uh, let's see what else we got here. So we had a question about using Sculptress or Dynamesh. So either way is fine. Uh, Sculptress will just automatically do the re-resolution for you. And one thing nice about Sculptress is that it's going to allow you to only add detail where you need it. Dynamesh is gonna add detail across your entire model. Neither way is a wrong way. Um, you can use both. Um, but uh, I usually end up, you know, at least for sculpting stuff recently, I'll stick entirely with Sculptress Pro. All right, so I'm gonna get a little more sculpting out of here and then we're gonna come in and we're gonna add a second subtool. So last week, or not even last week, Wednesday, we went through and uh, I generated a quick bust and uh, that ended up just being a single subtool. So one thing I do wanna cover this in this session here is a second subtool. And I'll show you guys how you can get that done. So with my gazelle here, this is just basically blocking out forms. Uh, you can go through and you can add you know, as much detail in this form as you want, and it's just basically all sculpting through here. And this I can fill, you know, easily an entire session of just you guys watching me just do this. Um, you can make some broad scale changes on your models with the move brushes as well. So I want these in a little bit more, maybe break these out. So I can select that move brush by BMV and get that. And then I can change my draw size and I can use this to adjust wider shapes. So if you need a big height change, we were just talking about using that uh, clay buildup and it was giving me those spikes, you can definitely use the move brush to get those changes too. And this will allow you to, you know, really change that silhouette quite a bit. And I'm just using move and just coming across the model and pulling to change my shapes. So if you have stuff that, you know, like this tail here had this kind of angle, I can quickly come in with the move brush and adjust this out. And you'll see I do a lot of this kind of tapping too. So I'm tapping the change. So another thing there with that, and this will allow you to make kind of wide scale changes across your mesh. In addition to the move brush is also the snake hook brush. And the snake hook brush is uh, pretty awesome for adding form and it works really well with uh, Sculptress Pro. So you'll see when I was in the move brush, the Sculptress mode has been grayed out. And so you won't be able to use Sculptress with move. So what that means is as I pull the mesh out, you're seeing I'm going to be able to, you know, just kind of change the geometry and make it crazy. Now, sometimes you can use this to your advantage because it will sometimes give you some nice happy accidents and then you can take those and kind of keep going with them and sculpt on them. So sometimes the move brush works uh, with those happy accidents. But if I wanted to make a change um, on the model and use uh, Sculptress Pro with a brush that's like move, what I recommend using is the snake hook brush. And so I can open up my brush palette here by hitting B and then I'm gonna hit S 
and then H, and that's gonna give me the snake hook brush. And what this brush is gonna do is it's gonna basically kind of give you a move. However, when you use it, uh, it will work with Sculptures Pro. So I can click on the back of the gazelle here and drag this out, and you see it's gonna allow me to grow shapes out of them. So let's say I want a winged, some sort of winged fire flame gazelle. You know, there I go. And now if I don't like this, I can come through, I can hit shift and I'll smooth these parts out too. So now I can make them, you know, kind of ethereal, like he's got flames and then more fire. And I can pull these out even more. So this is really fun to use if you want to make like trees or branches, like if you want to make a forest type gazelle, you can come in and quickly use these and they'll make some nice stuff. Another one to play with the Snake Hook brush and Sculptors Pro is the Spiral brush. So I'm gonna hit this one too because I just started making some trees. <laughs> so the Spiral brush will be, I think it's called Spiral. Let me make sure that's the right name, yes. So BSA will be the hotkey for the Spiral brush. And if I select that, what this is gonna do, let me get a large draw size here, is if you move it one way, it's gonna spin your mesh kind of like this. And if you move it the other way, it's gonna spin it in the opposite direction. And this makes really cool kind of tree branch types effects. So you can come in and just add these really quick. And now I got like this stuff going on. And this also makes some really awesome kind of sculptural things. So I can like change his antlers. And I got something like that going on. This gazelle is going crazy. It, it, it started off as just a normal gazelle. <laughs> we're gonna, I think we're gonna keep the, uh, his crazy back here. And so you can do this quite a bit and you can start getting spirals. So all sorts of different things you can do. And these make some really nice kind of swooping effects on your model there. And this is just the spiral brush with Sculptures Pro. It is, it is got a little nine tails. <laughs> all right, so that's a little quick primer on the Sculptures Pro the snake hook brush with Sculptures Pro and also Spiral. Now I was talking before I got into my tangent there on sculpting craziness. I feel like I can give him a weird snoot. Yeah, we're not gonna do that. I'll give him a weird bottom lip. There we go, he's gonna get that. He's turned into a moose. All right, so before we went on the tangent, uh, there's some uh, we had, I was talking briefly about adding other elements to your model. So right now we just have this as a single subtool. So this is all that exists. We got one single mesh in our scene. And basically I wanna come through and I wanna add a set of eyes for this, but I don't want the eyes to be the same mesh because I could come in you know, and start sculpting eyes, but let's say I wanna put eyelids on it, right? You know, I could come across and add eyelids like that. But then maybe if I don't like those eyelids, or maybe I want them to be open more than they are closed, I now have to modify the eye and the eyelids at the same time. So right now I'm sculpting everything on the same model. So if you think about this in like kind of traditional forms, you can get like little BBs or something for the eyes and then sculpt the clay around it. So I want to do a process that's similar to that. So there is a little macro inside of ZBrush here that will allow you to create a quick set of eyes that are gonna be set up with a specific material that's a little bit shiny and they're also gonna be black. So these are gonna give you like these little black eyeballs and it can be done in a button click. So if you're using ZBrush and you wanna add some quick eyes, you can come up here to the macro tab at the top here. In here you have a bunch of different presets or buttons that will kind of automate some stuff inside of ZBrush. And so some of these things are like snapping the model to the ground. So we had that ground floor grid before. If you want to take a model and snap it to ground, you can run that. Uh, we have some different things where we can zero the meshes to different axes. Um, you can change some of the depths. So there's a bunch of little like helpful things in this macro tab. Now, one of the helpful things in here is this append eyes. And if I come over here and just click this, this is gonna go through and just do a little process there. And you're gonna see it's gonna append these gigantic eyeballs. Now, after this happens, if I come into the tool palette and go to the subtool area, you can see I have my gazelle that I was sculpting there, and then directly below it, I have those eyes. Now, with these eyes, they're a little bit big, and I wanna reposition them and size them down. So to do this, I'm gonna come up here, and I'm gonna click on Move, Scale, or Rotate, and this is gonna give me the Gizmo 3D, and this is the universal manipulator inside of ZBrush, and on this manipulator, you have a few different options. 
So you have a scale option. I'm just going to scale up and down. You have a rotation where you can rotate around, and you also have a move. So I want to scale these down. So I'm going to grab this scale here and just scale these down, and then I'm going to rotate. And then in my side angle here, you can see that there is these move screen arrows. So I'm just going to take those and drag them up to the head there. Now the Gizmo 3D will position itself sometimes away from the mesh, and there's this little icon here that's called Go To Unmasked Mesh Center. It looks like a little home pip if you ever use Google Maps or Apple Maps. And if you click that, it's going to center back to your mesh. So now I'm going to get it right back to those eyes there. I can scale them down a little bit more. Just get back centered to them and then move them in. And now I can position these roughly where I want them to go. So I'm just using screen space moves basically for these. Just position them somewhere like so. And now I can switch back to draw mode. And so now I have these little black eyeballs now living in my scene. Now the subtool set over here, there it looks like it would be consistent for something that we have some questions about. Well, is it like Photoshop where you have layers? So these are actually separate elements or separate geometry in your scene. So this gazelle here is its own piece of geometry. It's its own mesh. So think of it as you can in, um, you know, just sculpting terms, like you have your ball of clay and that's what my gazelle is. And then these eyeballs here, these are a second element, those little BBs for the eyes. So it's just a separate tool. And inside of ZBrush, you can switch between these, and these are going to determine which ones you can manipulate at a time. So you can only manipulate one at a time. So right now I'm on the gazelle, and so now I can change that one. So if I wanted to sculpt on that, I could sculpt on that. And then if I want to manipulate the eyes, I select the eyes, and then I could sculpt on the eyes. Well, I don't really want to sculpt on the eyes. I want to keep them where they are. So I'm going to make sure I'm on the gazelle. And now I can use this gazelle and I'm going to sculpt around it and I'm going to sculpt around those eyes that I just inset as that other model. So this way I can add elements to my mesh that aren't going to be touched or distorted when I'm working on another model. So if I come across the gazelle now I can add those eyelids in and these are going to be separate from those eyes but now I can encase the eyeballs with eyelids really easily. And then if I don't like those you know I can smooth them out, change them, modify them, so you can do everything, and now I just have that other element in my scene there. That's those eyeballs. So that is how you can quickly add a set of eyes. And so now you can see I'm starting to flush out my gazelle through here. And this is all the sculptural stuff I've been doing here. It's all been, you know, just coming in and just sculpting in a positive and negative way and then smoothing. And if you have a pen tablet, you're going to be able to do this with pen pressure too. And this is going to allow you to, if you press really lightly on your tablet, you're going to get a light stroke. And if you press really hard, you're going to get a hard stroke. So you can use these to your advantage too to just kind of add forms to it. And then we go into the Bob, Bob Ross Zen mode. So let me look at these questions quick. Oh man, we got a ton. You guys are you guys are questioning today. So let's see here. So Dark Knight, he is asking about um, RAM for usage of ZBrush. So basically ZBrush, so just a quick thing here, is ZBrush uses your computer processor. It does not care about your video card. So you can pretty much run ZBrush on pretty old machines. So I know my MacBook here is not one of the newest ones and uh, it's still running ZBrush perfectly fine because ZBrush is going to use just your computer processor. So you could have whatever graphics card you want and ZBrush is still going to run. Now Dark Knight was asking about RAM. Okay, So ZBrush loves RAM too or memory. So it likes processor cores in your computer that are high speed and it likes RAM. Those are the two main things there. Also, it likes SSD drives because there is some caching that happens when you do like rotations on your model. And so that's another thing. Definitely, if you're looking to kind of build a machine is RAM, processor, and then uh, SSD drive. So the Z cut option here at the top, we have a question about what does the Z cut button do? So the Z cut is actually used in the 2.5D uh, settings here. So it's not really anything that's used um, particularly in the 3D mode. But if you switch to 2.5D, that will end up uh, cutting up and allow you, allows you to basically cut 
the 2.5D surface out. Um, so All Loops is asking, oh no, he's, he's telling, sorry. Let's see what else we got here. Going through these questions. This is a live stream, it will be recorded. So we have a question about scaling in two axes. Yes, you can do that as well. Um, so if you're performing um, scale options, uh, there is a alternate one. I wanna say it's holding down control or shift. I may have to get back to you on that one. I have a video on uh, Ask ZBrush and you can do the scale stuff. You can, yeah, so you can definitely uh, do it. Uh, ZBrush does use multi-threading, so you have a question about that. 2.5D is how ZBrush started out. So you had a question about what is 2.5D. 2.5D is basically, if you think of a 2D image, but it contains depth information. So that is the 0.5 aspect of it. And things inside of ZBrush, one of the common things that people have occur to them is if they're sculpting, 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 and then they accidentally press T on their keyboard. And that will drop you out of edit mode. Now, currently in the newer versions of ZBrush, there is this little dialog that's gonna pop up and ask you if you wanna switch. Now, if you're sculpting in 3D and this little dialog pops up, definitely click this do not switch button <laughs> because if you do switch it, then you're gonna end up as your model is gonna drop down to 2.5D. And oftentimes when people are just starting to learn ZBrush, they'll come across this and they'll get to this stage here. And this model right now is dropped to 2.5D. So what this means is I can no longer rotate um, and if I try to draw, I just start putting out more of my little gazelles here. And now you can see I just start getting this effect. So what I'm doing here is, what ZBrush is doing here is ZBrush was originally started as a 2.5D painting application. And so you would take something and you would paint in this 2.5D. So you paint with 2D and with depth. And this would allow you to get different layers of stuff on top of each other. And you could use different brushes and different effects to get different designs on your uh, sculpting. And then it converted more to the 3D aspect, which is what is primarily used for today. But the 2.5D is going to give you this kind of effect. And so if you end up with something like this, the way to fix this or get out of it is first, don't panic. <laughs> your models are still living over here. And they haven't gone away. So as long as you have not saved a... a basically just your document here and you've saved a done a quick save or gone to the file save as your mesh is still there you next want to hit Control n on your keyboard and this is going to correlate to this layer palette up here i'm going to move this so you guys can see this and it's going to correlate to this clear button right here and so this is going to clear this layer because basically this layer right here this layer system is related to 2.5d so control N is gonna clear that out. So if you have a whole bunch of these guys all over the place doing craziness, control N, clear it out. Then don't panic. Draw out one more of your creatures. Then come up here and press edit or click edit or press T on your keyboard. And you're gonna notice when you're in edit mode, you're gonna get this white bar that's gonna come around your UI here. And now you're going to, when you rotate, you're gonna get your model back. Now, another way you can drop stuff down to the 2.5D canvas is using Snapshot. And Snapshot will allow you to make you know, different kind of views of your model. So if I wanted to say, see the model like this while I was working on it, I can just position it over here and hit Shift plus S on my keyboard. And that's gonna snapshot it. So now I have another version of my mesh over there. So this one's in 3D and this one's now in 2.5D. And so occasionally, if you're used to using saving hotkeys and other applications, Shift S may be that hotkey. So if you hit it, you'll end up with these kind of multiple models on your canvas. Once again, don't panic. Hold down Control, press N, clear it out, and you're gonna get back here. So we have one question asking, is there any uses for using 2.5D? So the, one of the really nice uses for 2.5D is creating tiling textures. So you can take a model that's in 3D. I'm, I'm not gonna get into it because I have to change my canvas to get it uh, set up. But um, you can take a model that's in 3D and you can put it on your canvas using that snapshot function. And then if you hold down the tilde key 
on your keyboard, you can able to tile the canvas and it'll actually tile seamlessly. And then you can position more and tile and position more and tile. So it's kind of like doing, if you've ever taken a sheet of paper and made a tiling pattern, it's very much that principle. So you'd place one and then you move it, offset it. So you end up seeing just parts of it in the corners and you place your other one in the middle and then you can offset your canvas and then place more and more and more and you're gonna end up with a tiling pattern. So there are definitely some still some uh, uses of the 2.5D system. All right, so back on topic here. So here we have my crazy gazelle. It needs a lot more love and a lot more sculpting, but hopefully some of this has given you some kind of inspiration or ideas on what you can create. Now, another set of brushes that I wanna go into are the VDM brushes. And the VDM brushes stands for Vector Displacement Mesh. And what this is, is that normal brushes inside a ZBrush usually have alphas that correlate to them. So this one has just an alpha that's driving that stroke. So as I sculpt, it's taking that alpha and it's dragging on the surface. These alphas, which also can be generated in 2.5D, um, are basically just height maps or depth maps, right? So they just have a gradient ramps from white to black and the whitest parts are gonna give you your heights and then the darkest ones are gonna give you your lows and it's just giving you that ramped value between it. Now, these are the standard ones and a lot of the brushes inside of ZBrush use these. So you can come through and actually select different ones by clicking this area over here. So say I wanna to go to like a circle now and as I sculpt, I'm now gonna get a rounded stroke. I can even go something crazy like a star and now I'm gonna end up getting kind of like the star pattern appearing on my stroke as well. So you can definitely customize any of your brushes and change those alphas that are linked to them. Now, these are just the normal 2D ones. So the vector displacement mesh alphas, let me move my, my keyboard, are brushes that are usually labeled as chisel inside of ZBrush. So if I open up my brush palette again, you can see at the top here, I've got chisel, chisel 3D, and chisel creature. So if you first start out with ZBrush, uh, I highly recommend trying the Chisel Creaser brush. It's got some really cool stuff in it. And so to do this, we just hit B on our keyboard or click here to open up the brush palette. And then I'm gonna come and select the Chisel Creature brush. Now when I select this brush, you're gonna see at the top here, I'm gonna get a bar. And this bar is showing me all the parts that exist in this brush. And this is a VDM brush, so that vector displacement mesh brush. And these parts that are in this model are planes of geometry, and then they've been sculpted. So they're taking that flat surface and changing it to give you a form. Now, one thing nice about these brushes is, is this that they allow undercuts. So the alpha, which is that strictly 2.5, or the strictly depth image, doesn't allow for undercuts. But VDM, or the chisel brushes, will allow for this undercut process. So what this means, if I come and say select the scale one brush, and let me find an area here, let's smooth this out a little bit, and I apply this here, you can apply these just by clicking and dragging, you'll see as it applies, I'm now getting that scale generated. And I can come through and actually start adding these on my mesh. So I can get a whole bunch of like different little effects. Now this is really good for hair and fur. Now one thing you'll notice as when I do this, I'm getting this undercut right? It's undercutting that surface. So I'm getting these nice overhangs. Now this is one thing you can't do with a strictly 2D alpha. So it has to be a 3D alpha or a vector displacement mesh. And you'll notice when you have one of these selected, they're going to get this little 3D icon in the corner. So if you're just using the 2D alphas, you're not going to get this undercuts. And that's the real power of this brush. Now, some of the ones that are in the preset here for the chisel creature are really good, uh, especially for my crazy gazelle here. So we have some ears. And so instead of, you know, generating an ear, say by pulling it out or sculpting it, I can just come in and add it, All right? So now my gazelle's got ears instantly. Um, and you can just undo that and reposition it. You can rotate them around. And then after it's on your model, you can go then and sculpt on it more, change it and do whatever you like. If I didn't like his horns here, maybe they're a little too crazy. I can make sure I still have Sculptress Active and smooth on and I can smooth these out. And as I smooth the Sculptress, they're gonna just remove them. So I can get them all the way down to the base here. And then let's say I wanna try some new horns. So I'm gonna grab this spike too. And let's grow those out now. So they're getting a little bit crazy. So now he's kind of gone a different way. I can adjust those. Now the VDM brushes are gonna be working on the basis of the amount of topology you have on your mesh. So you can see this area through here is a little bit sparse in terms of topology. So to increase this, 
if I have Sculptors Pro active, I can get a small draw size and then smooth this and just add some more topology in there. I can get a little bit smaller, add some more topology. And now if I go back and grab that spike brush again, you'll see now it's gonna get a little bit more resolution as I drag it out. So there's a bunch of different ones you can apply through here. So we can get some weird horns like this. You can use these with symmetry. And you start adding these. So maybe this guy's got you know, multiple kind of growths. He's one of those anomalies in the mesh there. And you can see I can just start adding different things. Now there's also some other interesting ones. So we have some nostrils. So if I want to add some weird nostrils to them, I can come in and add those. And look, instead of sculpting it now, I can just use that brush and I've got those generated. Now like anytime I can switch back to say that clay buildup brush and go in and sculpt on these two enhance these, change these, modify them. So there's really a bunch of different ways you can manipulate the surfaces of your model. You're not really locked into any one shape or design or form. But that was using the chisel creature brush. Oh, let me make sure I select it there. Get back in there. There's also some other chisel brushes. So we have one that is called just chisel 3D. This one has a bunch of other kind of creature parts. So it has some different noses, some mouths. It also has some sets that are, have eyeballs built in. It's got some more humanoid ears. Uh, sometimes you can also come through and you know manipulate, say, a, something that's supposed to have one effect and use it a different way. So, like, say for these ears here, you know, you can always take one of these and let's say I want to give him a mouth. So now he's like doing this weird yawn, right? And so that was actually using an ear part. So one thing, you know, definitely. These don't always don't have, like an ear doesn't have to be an ear. It can be something else. And you can take these and experiment with your meshes. Let me actually add more topology down here. And now I can get a different result. So now he's got some weird chin things. And then if I do it this way, he's got that mouth again. <laughs> so all sorts of things you can do. And then I can go back to say that move brush. Make this a little bit longer down there. Let me pull this out. Give him a little more appropriate mouth. The anatomy's all over the place, but we're, we're gonna go with it. And then I come in and fix that up with a little bit of sculpting through there. Smooth it out a little bit. There we go. Don't know what's going on, but we're, we're going with it. So there you go. <laughs> all right. So now that we got his mouth open, we, he needs to be doing something like breathing fire, Something's gotta happen here. Uh, so we're gonna add some more elements. I just wanna fix it because it's, it's going a little bit crazy. Let's move that out. All right, so we're gonna give him, um, hmm, let's give him a tongue. So we showed how, earlier I showed how you can add a set of eyeballs and that was using this macro option up here and the append eyes. So instead of appending uh, using that macro, let's say we want to add a tongue. And to add a tongue, we can add another piece of geometry and then just manipulate that geometry. So to add another level in here, another part to this mesh, is I want to go to the tool subtool area and I want to click this append option. Now you have two options here that allow you to append in a different tool. So you have append and insert. And append is going to append it to the bottom of your subtool list. Insert is going to append it right after the subtool you currently have selected. So either of these are going to work um, for what you want to do. So I'm going to come over here and click append. And this is going to open up a little quick pick menu here. And I think you can see most of it. And in here, I can now select a piece of geometry to append. Now, most of the times, if you're doing just stuff with sculptural assets, I highly recommend just grabbing the Sphere 3D. This is going to give you a mesh that you want. So I'm going to come over here and just find the Sphere 3D and click it. And you see now that's going to append it into my subtool list there. And if I zoom out, you can see I got this gigantic sphere and my fire gazelle is in the middle of it. So I'm going to come over here and I'm going to select that sphere. And I want to scale this down because it's way too massive. So I'm going to come back up to the top and I'm going to switch to move, scale, or rotate. And in one of these, I'm now going to scale this down. And this is just going to make that a little bit smaller. And then I can now position it. So I'm just using the move screen space here. And zoom into his mouth here, scale it down a little bit more. And then we had some questions about the kind of um, non-uniform scale. So you can use scales like this to scale out and in. The scale options also have some different things. So if I hold down control, I can actually clip it. 
So you can get some different processes. So that's holding down the control key and using that scale. So there's a little bit of uh, hidden elements that are in the Gizmo 3D2. And I can just position this around and scale it down just to you know, give me another piece of geometry that's relatively in that area. And now that I have that in the area, I'm switching out of the move scale and rotate and going back to draw. And now I'm gonna grab my move brush and now I'm gonna mess with this a little bit more. I'm gonna hit X to make sure symmetry's on. And I now can just tailor this shape some. And basically all I'm doing is just pushing and pulling. And so I'm just trying to get initial elements here to this. Now at any time, if you have a subtool selected and you have multiple subtools in your scene, you can activate this solo button. You guys can kind of see it down here. And this will isolate temporarily the subtool you're on and only show you that subtool. So with my tongue tool here, I'm gonna come down here and click on solo. And now you'll see that I only see the tongue and my other two objects are hidden. So now with this, I can just focus my sculpting on this. So I can get back to that clay buildup brush there, do a little smoothing to clean it up a little bit. And then I can come in and start sculpting on this. Add that little middle area down the tongue there, smooth this out a little bit more. I still got this crazy star alpha on there from earlier. And I'm just changing my draw size and cleaning this up a little bit. Now, if I wanna add like a little tip or a ridge to the tongue here too, I can switch to the damn standard brush. This is another go-to brush. So B, D, S is the hotkey for that. Now this brush, when you select it, you're gonna see that it's gonna have the Z add and Z sub flipped. So what this means is when you use this brush by default without holding anything, it's gonna cut into the surface rather than add to it. So this is handy if you just wanna quickly come in and you know add that middle line to the tongue there and then smooth it out some. And if you want it to sculpt in a positive direction, you have to hold down the Alt key. And then that will end up giving you the little lip. And this little kind of tracing the edges is gonna give you these nice little areas that catch light on a model. So it helps when doing things like that. And now if I have something like that, I can get out of solo here. And now I've got my gazelle here, my crazy gazelle with this crazy tongue. Now I can still keep coming through and manipulating them if I want. So I can switch to that move and maybe make it a little bit smaller, maybe like that. We have no clue what he's doing. He's, he's just got this crazy tongue. And there we go. Now I'm gonna go through that process one more time and I'm gonna add a set of teeth too because he needs some teeth now. Um, so to append a subtool in again, so I'm gonna come over here to the tool palette, go to the subtool area, and then I'm gonna click the append option. I'm gonna this time pick a cylinder 3D object. So teeth, if you're ever doing teeth, basically you can think of them as like a cylinder object that's like this, and then they just have lines in it. That's, that's pretty much what a set of teeth is. I'm sure a dentist will come in and start yelling at me and say that is not what teeth are. But if you just want a quick set of teeth, it's just a cylinder, it's just a cylinder. So I'm gonna take the cylinder here. I'm gonna go back to that move scale and rotate, scale it down a little bit. I'm gonna then angle it and then move it. <laughs> so we got a question here from Dr. Beard. He's asking if the teeth are gonna have fused roots. Probably, it's gonna, be a, it's gonna be a messy gum line. And so I'm just rotating and positioning and scaling. And I only want them a little bit visible there. And I kind of just, right now, this is a secondary subtool, so I just appended it. So I'm just jamming it into the mesh. I'm not concerned about, you know, what's going on here. It's just, you know, it's just sitting there. And that's all it's gonna do. That's the entire principle there. Um, if I was making this for 3D printed, I'd want to probably attach it a little bit better. But for right now, this is what's happening. And there we go. Now I'm going to get back to draw mode there. Look at them. They're pretty. <laughs> I'm a little, got a little bit crazy there, so I'm going to undo a little bit. I got a little rotation mess. We'll go back to this. I'm going to go back to my clay buildup brush. Make sure I still have sculptors active. Come in with that small draw size. Hit X to turn on symmetry. And now we have a little sculpting surface we can apply to. And this I'm just sculpting quick. I can isolate this out with Solo again, smooth out this bottom here, give it a little more topology. This would be a good time to use masking as well because you can actually say mask out an area and then use the move brush to 
get you some teeth. So there's a lot of little tricks like that you can do just to enhance what you're doing. This is going to be a hot mess of a gum line here. And then coming in with those edging again that we talked about using the damn standard brush. Pulling out that little area that's going to catch a little bit of light. And we're all the way up there. Let's go. Let's get back here. And then adding this in. There's some really, really, really pretty teeth. Then we can add some little, some little noise in the back here. Um, if you ever press V on your keyboard, uh, this is also another thing that may happen when you're sculpting. This is going to invert your color over here. So if you ever press V, this is going to flip the color from black to white. And since right now I don't have any color baked in on this model, it's turning it black. So if you get ever have this happen, uh, just hit V on your keyboard and that will usually resolve it. So one thing there if you ever hit that hotkey. Now I need to fix this mouth here because it's getting a little crazier. And this is where you can spend, you know, <laughs> hours just manipulating forms, changing stuff, deciding right now his head looks like really big compared to the rest of the body because I opened up his mouth. He's got this really, really skinny body. Like he's pretty much 90% head. <laughs> so there's a lot of things here going wrong um, with my creature here today. Now, at a certain point when you're using Sculptress Pro, um, your brushes may get a little sluggish. So right now, if I go and sculpt this, it's not feeling as smooth as it was originally when I was sculpting. And this is because I've now added a ton of geometry to my model. So before when I was sculpting on the mesh, it was really light. It was like 75,000 points. And now I'm at 227,000 points. And so when ZBrush is using Sculptress Pro, it's looking at your entire model and then it's dividing it where you sculpt. So it's putting a lot of you know, information into that mesh and it's analyzing a lot of the surface. So at this stage, what we can do if your Sculptress Pro starts getting a little bit bogged down is you can come up here and you can disable it. And when you disable it, it's just going to turn off that automatic tessellation. Now, most of the times, this is a good solution, especially if you've already established your base forms and your base silhouette. Because you're already going to have all those areas filled with a lot of topology because you've been using Sculptress Pro on those surfaces. So now if you just come in and sculpt normally, this is going to allow you to you know, get that fluidity back to that brush stroke. And oftentimes this is going to give you kind of the result you're looking for. Now, another way you can handle this is you can decimate the model. And so currently right now with my mesh here, it's got all the sculptural stuff I'm working on. I've still got a lot of things I want to mess with, but he may have parts of his geometry on him that aren't really needed. So he may have like a lot of topology in here, but this is a really smooth surface. So all those drunk triangles and quads are just being wasted there, right? So it's just making my model heavy, but it's not giving anything to the mesh. So it's not adding sculptural detail. It's not adding a line. It's not guiding anything. It's just wasting space. So what I can do at this stage is that I can decimate the model down. And we have a process called decimation. And this is done with a plugin called Decimation Master. It lives in the Z plugin tab here. And what Decimation Master is going to do, it's going to analyze your sculptural detail on your mesh. It's going to say, hey, you want this detail here, but you have other areas that, you know, don't really have much detail. And it's going to go through and it's going to try to reduce the polygons in those areas where it's not needed. So as an example here with my <laughs> crazy gazelle, if I go to the Z plugin tab, they have a bunch of different options. And if you're first using ZBrush, you know, definitely uh, you can ignore <laughs> pretty much 90% of this. Uh, so don't get bogged down on, there's a lot of things inside of ZBrush, but if you just stick to like the very basic things, you can still get a lot of stuff done. So very down here at the bottom of the Decimation Master is these things called presets. And these have 20K, 35K, 75K, 150K, and 250K. Now what these are gonna allow you to do is you can just simply click this button and it's gonna drop your model's topology down to that amount. So my model currently has 229,000 points. And if I come in here and click 75K, ZBrush is gonna run this decimation process, look at that sculptural detail, and drop it down to those points. So I'm gonna go ahead and do this right now and just process this mesh. And you'll see that after that's done, there wasn't any change. <laughs> so if I undo this, this is what I had, and this is what I got. And you can see that this is this different mesh. So this is the 229,000 one. 
That's the 74,000 one. So it went through and it held and retained the majority of those details. And now I have a lighter mesh that has the same sculpting details that I had originally. Now, if I turn on my wireframes, you're gonna be able to see this a little bit better. So here we have the crazy version here, and this one's actually got a bunch of polygroups from the initial mannequins I used. But if you look at the density in some of these areas, like right through here, you can see it's pretty dense. And then afterwards, it's not as dense anymore. So it just went through and reduced topology in areas where it wasn't needed. And now my model is gonna be a lot more lightweight, and if I come in and use the clay buildup brush, now with Sculptors Pro, it's feeling a lot better. So it's back to being that really fast sculptural process again. So if your model starts getting heavy when you're using uh, Sculptors Pro, just run Decimation Master or you can turn Sculptors Pro off and then that'll allow you to come in and you know, sculpt back on your mesh quick and fast. So I'm gonna check the questions here. I've got about 20 minutes in this session left. And so I want to show you guys how to quickly paint and then also render out something because I don't think this guy's going to get any better in 20 minutes. He needs about, he needs about 40 minutes to, to get the different stuff. All right, so we had some questions about Dynamesh levels. So this model was done with a mannequin. So I used, it was started from the Zizu, which if you go to Lightbox and open this up, in here, if you go to the project area, there is a Zizu folder here. And in here, there is a whole range of these mannequin models that the wonderful artist Shane Olson created for us. And he went through and made all these different animals. And you can come into here and select any of these and start to use these as bases to sculpt on. So there's a whole wide range of creatures here. The gazelle model that he made is the one I'm currently massacring on the screen. So we started from that and then went through the process of taking that and converting it to a adaptive skin and then sculpting on it with Sculptress Pro. So for the, we had a question about the mouth. For the mouth, what I did with this is I used a vector displacement mesh brush, which is called the chisel creature brush. And so I just selected that brush there and I took a part, actually it wasn't the chisel creature brush, it was the chisel 3D brush, and I took this ear part, which is usually used for making ears, and instead of making an ear, I took it and I drew it out upside down, and that gave me a mouth. So that's how, <laughs> that is how the mouth of the uh, crazy creature got created. There's other ways you can make mouths. Uh, you could, I could have just came through and say, grab the clay buildup brush with Sculptress Pro, and just started pulling the form out, and that would also give me kind of that shelf for that mouth, and then I can go back and clean it up. So there's a whole bunch of different ways, but I used the VDM brush uh, that was supposed to be for an ear, and I used that to create the mouth out of the bottom of the uh, gazelle here. Let's see what else we got here. So for ZBrush, Pesto is asking, uh, Starting out with base meshes versus Z-spheres, any advice? So the Z-sphere is just gonna get you to a base mesh. That's the basic principle there. You could also just start with a sphere, turn on Sculptress Pro and start pulling it out with the snake hook brush, another excellent way. Um, the thing with the Z-spheres and the mannequins is that they kind of have this IK system built onto them. So you can actually you know, pose them in different ways. Um, Shane's method is also awesome. I don't know, it's another great way to create characters. So it really doesn't matter, it's just what you kind of feel like doing and what's more comfortable on your end. So I'd say try them both out and uh, see which one you like better. So Katar is asking the difference between Decimation Master and Remesh. So Decimation is going to give you triangles all the way through. So it doesn't care about trying to give you nice claws, doesn't care about trying to give you, you know, edge loops through your mesh. It's just gonna go through and it's worried about, hey, you've got some stuff over here that's wasted space. I'm gonna clean that up and reduce your polygon count. Z-Remesher is another process we have in ZBrush. It's in the tool palette, geometry, Z-Remesher area right here. And what Z-Remesher will do, it's gonna go through your mesh and it's going to try to give you nice, clean topology throughout the entire thing. Now, I can't guarantee that this mesh is going to give us a good result, but we'll go here and we'll run this so you guys can see the difference here. This may take a second. And depending on how much detail and mesh you have, uh, 
it may not give you the result you're looking for. Like these little things here are usually um, questionable. I wouldn't probably have those if I was gonna run ZRemesher. But you can see this is the result I got with the ZRemeshed version. And so you can see it's given me a lot cleaner geometry uh, than what Decimation Master give, gave me, but I also lost all those detail. So the process for using uh, ZRemesher is usually what you'd wanna do is you'd want to duplicate your model uh, using the tool subtool duplicate option. After you have that duplicated version of it, you then run that duplication, duplicated model through ZRemesher, and then you'd subdivide that mesh back up and then project the sculptural details back onto it. So it's a quick way, and you know, it, it took seconds to give me topology here. Um, so it's a very quick way to come through and generate topology. This may not be your final topology, may not be the exact topology you want. You see that some stuff over here that you know, I'd probably clean up if I was doing it manually, but in a two seconds it took to process that, um, it's a really, really nice result. So that's basically the difference between ZRemesher and Decimation. Decimation is reducing polygons, keeping sculpting forms. ZRemesher is giving you a whole brand new mesh. Uh, we have a, another question. So Pesto is asking about primitives. So up here we have uh, there's different tools and some of these are primitives, like the cylinder 3D object is a primitive. Um, if you select the cylinder 3D object or any primitive over here, and you come down here, there's gonna be this initialize menu that's gonna exist in these. And these will allow you to change different things. So I can add you know, inner radiuses, change the sizes. This is more kind of an advanced thing um, in getting into stuff here, but basically anytime you append a primitive object to a scene that has uh, poly mesh objects in it, it's gonna automatically convert it. So you will never be able to keep a primitive object as a primitive in your scene. So you basically select them, modify them, and then you can append them, use them to do other things, but they're never going to be um, able to go back to that initialized state uh, in another scene. So one little thing there on the primitives. Uh, Tanasi is asking if I was posing the character. I'm not going to get to the posing stuff today. Um, but with the mannequins I showed in the earlier process, if you watch the beginning of that, I do go in and how you can kind of move and reposition mannequins. So, question about using, uh, in practice, using to make meshes for games engines. Is it, should we use decimation for hard surface and then zero mesher for organics? Um, it's really, it's up to you. So most of the time, zero mesher is going to give you quads um, and it's going to, you know, give you some geometry that may be able to be animated. If you're not animating the object, you can just simply just decimate it and it's going to be fine um, because it's going to hold all the detail you want and it's going to be triangles, quads. Game engines are just going to turn it into triangles anyway. Uh, so decimation is usually the way to go for any static objects. Uh, definitely if you're doing characters or things that pose, especially around the joints, you're going to want some edge loops in there, especially if you're doing skinning or weighting to make stuff move for the game engine. Um, having a bunch of triangles in there is not going to be what you're going to want uh, to definitely get clean posing. Um, I don't know what the, you said there was a four sign. Okay, so the little number here, so question is, what's this little icon here that has a four on it? That's going to show you how many tools or subtools that tool contains. So my skill, my gazelle here has four different subtools, so it's giving me a number four. This one has only one, so it's giving me nothing. And then if I duplicate it, you can see now I got a two, because I have two of these in here. So that's what that little number there is. All right, so I got about 10 minutes here, so I'm gonna go quickly into rendering stuff, or painting. So to paint inside a ZBrush, it's very easy. Uh, we first just need to tell ZBrush that, hey, this model needs, is ready to accept vertex paint. And what we're doing here is we're just gonna paint on the vertices of the model. So every point on the mesh here is gonna be able to accept a color, and then that color will be able to be populated. So the more density or more mesh quality you have, the more color you're gonna be able to get out of your mesh. Now to tell ZBrush, hey, I wanna start painting, first just select the model you want to paint, and then we're gonna go down to the tool menu and go all the way down to the poly paint area and activate this colorize button. And it's gonna say, hey ZBrush, activate the color on the model. Now the default color on the mesh is gonna be white. So you can see here, this model has not changed since I turned this on. You'll also notice that if a model has painting or is ready to be painted, it'll have this little paintbrush icon in the subtool palette as well. And you can toggle that off there or you can go down to that colorize button and turn it on off. Now once you have your tool set up for paint, now we just need to select a brush. 
Uh, you can select any brush and turn on the RGB value up here, and that will allow you to paint. So you can actually paint and sculpt at the same time. Um, for just painting purely, there's actually a brush just called paint that works really well. So I'm gonna hit B on my keyboard to bring up that brush palette, isolate by the letter P, and then paint is the brush there. So you can see that's what paint is. So BPA was the hotkey there. And now with this, we can just select a color. You have a few ways in which you can select colors. So I can use this little color picker over here. If you wanna pick something that's already on the surface of the canvas, if you hover over anything on the canvas and you press C on your keyboard, it's gonna pick that color. So I can come across anything in ZBrush here and it's gonna start picking that color. And so you can come across and pick various things and you'll see my color over here is changing. But the best way usually is come over here and just select a color. Now you'll notice when I change the color over here that these models change too. So the tongue is changing color and also the teeth. And this is because these were not activated to accept that colorized information yet. So they're just accepting whatever color I have selected. So if I come over here and turn on their paintbrush icons, you're gonna see they're gonna go back to that white, which is what they're really filled with. But if I turn off their paint, then they're gonna accept whatever color I have selected over here. So if he wants that nice kind of bluish purple tongue, there you go. But we're gonna turn them all on right now, so they're just white. Painting is very simple. You can just come over and select your color, and then up here, make sure RGB is turned on. You can adjust your intensity through here, and then you can just click and drag, and then I'll apply the paint to the surface. Now, if you have Sculptress Pro turned on still, when you paint, it's still gonna look at the size of your brush and it's gonna increase the density. So you're gonna be able to get a really nice clean paint. However, this could very well like bring up the polygon count of your model pretty quick. So if I do a small brush and draw out, let's change my color here. You're gonna see I'm gonna get a nice clean stroke through there. If I had Sculptress Pro turned off, I'm gonna get something that may not be as clean depending on how much topology is on the surface. So your topology is gonna depend on the quality of your poly painting. And to paint, it's just, you know, click and drag to paint. You can adjust your different uh, intensity. You can change your stroke type over here. Let me move my keyboard. And you have some different ones. You have some color sprays that are pretty nice. And this will allow you to come through. I can make a larger brush size there and just kind of fill things with color. Let me turn down my intensity a little bit. And this guy's going, he's going all over the place today. He's, he's going with this color. We threw out the gazelle coloring. So I had a bunch of images I was gonna reference and pull color from, but this is what we ended up with. That's what we ended up today. So there you go. And that's the, the quick rundown on painting. If you wanna fill an entire object with color, you can come up here to the color palette up here, and then there's a fill object option, and this will take whatever color you currently have selected and just fill your entire mesh. Now, masking will also be respected in this, so if you have anything masked out, that area will be protected. So remember, you can always use masking to protect. So I can fill the entire model there. You can see I had my intensity set to 29, so when I did that color fill object, it didn't fill it 100%. But if I do it again, I can go back to 100%, and I can change to a different coloring there, and kind of go back up with that. So that's your quick rundown on painting. Now let's say during this session you were following along and you made a beautiful gazelle. Hopefully something as beautiful as this. And you wanna share it to your friends, you wanna post it on Facebook, you wanna send it out to the ZBrush at home hashtag on Twitter. So to do this, we can just render this out quick and you have a few ways of rendering things. So right now in ZBrush, I'm in preview mode. This is what I get in preview. You can also come up here and click BPR, and this will render with best preview render, so you'll get some shadows and it'll clarify and kind of smooth things out a little bit. Finally, you also have another render in the render palette up here that is called best. This will apply kind of an ambient occlusion process across everything and give you another desired result. Now, after you use one of those processes, either preview or BPR, you can save this out by coming up here to keyboard, move out of the way to the document area, and you have two options to export this out. You have a export, which will allow you to export out just the image that you see on the canvas, or you have export screen grab, which will export out the entire ZBrush UI. So if you wanna show your friends that were using ZBrush to create your <laughs> blue gazelle here, you can use export screen grab and it'll give you the UI and then also the character on screen. If you just want the character on screen, you can just click this export option here and it'll just give you what's on your canvas. So to do this, just click it, 
Uh, then we just need to navigate to where you want to soar this thing. Let me move my keyboard out of the screen here. Wait for it, wait for it. And then down here you can save it as a, oh man, we got, a, we got titles all over the place. There we go. Save it as a JPEG or as a PNG, a bitmap, or a TIFF. If you save it as a JPEG, this will give you a little window that's gonna pop up. And in this little window, you can crop and frame your creation here. So I can make sure I get only the prettiest parts of this gazelle in the scene here. You can adjust some other options like your quality and your file size. And then down here, you can't see it, but there's a little OK button. And when you click OK, it'll save that out. And then that image will be immortalized onto your desktop as that JPEG. And then you can take it and you can upload it to Twitter and use the hashtag ZBrush at home and show me the madness that you made. So there you go. All right, let's see if there's any quick ones I can come through and answer quick, about five minutes, and then we'll sign off here. I thank you guys for coming to show this out. We have a comment that polypaint is the same thing as vertex color. Yes, so definitely polypaint is the same thing as vertex color. So if you have applications that accept vertex color, the polypaint is the same thing. We just like to call it different things. So yes, you can export the polypaint out. So Eclipse is asking, do I need to be really good at 2D drawing or can I do good 3D sculpting by just practicing in ZBrush? So if you give me a piece of paper, I can give you a bunch of garbage. <laughs> you give me a, I can take a piece of clay or sculpt in ZBrush and I, I can give you what you want. But if you give me a piece of paper, you're not gonna get much. Um, I heard a, I can't remember who did it, but there was an interesting uh, thing I listened to about uh, that kind of perception and how a lot of 3D artists often can't draw. And um, one thing that may be the reason for that is that we don't deal in perspective too well. And so the computer takes care of the perspective. And so we are better at you know, manipulating the forms in 3Ds because we don't have to worry about perspective. So uh, yes, uh, ZBrush does not use your GPU, doesn't care about it. So it just uses your processor, RAM, and then it likes SSD drives. To export a model for 3D printing, you can just go to the tool palette over here and click this export button. This will open another little dialog and you can export out as an OBJ, STL, or PLY. We also have a 3D print exporter in the Z plugins tab here that will allow you to export out for 3D printing as well. Uh, this model would probably not print too well in, in its current state because it has a lot of floating geometry and some thin areas that may get, need to get cleaned up. Um, but definitely you can export things out for 3D printing, no problem. Um, you just need to make sure that you take care of your mesh because right now I've got some intersecting geometry. I've probably got some teeth that are doing like some weird funky stuff. Um, so this one would probably not go directly into it. Um, for scaling, there is a plugin called Scale Master in here and you can run this and this will allow you to set a starting size for your mesh. So let's say I want this model to be two inches tall, right? So from his feet to his head, I want it to be two inches tall. So I went to the, let me do this again, Z plugin tab, uh, opened up the Scale Master project. I hit set scene scale. Once this opens up, it's gonna tell me the model's generic units. And basically I wanna come through and I wanna select the size of the measurement that closely resembles what, it's, what I want to get to. So I want this to be about two inches, right? So I'm gonna choose this one right here, this inch one. So I don't really wanna choose feet, centimeters, millimeters. I wanna choose this one right here. This is gonna go through and it's just gonna rescale your model in the scene. Now, after you have that set, I can now go black in, back in here and you'll see it's gonna change this to inches and I can set this sliders to subtool size and you'll see I'm gonna get the values of that mesh. So right now it's coming in at 0.7 by 1.13 by 0.9. So if I wanna resize everything to be two, I can come to this Y value, click it, type in two, hit enter. You wanna make sure you press enter on your keyboard. And then I can click this resize subtool button. You wanna make sure the all button's on. This will go through and resize everything in my scene. And now my crazy gazelle here, if I come back here and click sliders to subtool size, you can see it's gonna be at that two inches. And now if I export this out as an OBJ file, it's gonna be exported out in dimensions that represent millimeters. So it's gonna be the, was it 25.4 times two um, in this vertical direction in the millimeters format. So if you import that in, and say, hey, this is a millimeters file, it's gonna bring it in at two inches tall. So that's how you can export out to size. 
Yan Sculpt made the video that I was coming on about the um, drawing in drawing in 3D, drawing in 2D and drawing in 3D. So you go check that out. All right. I think that's it. So definitely uh, CPU preference, you want the faster. So some things inside of ZBrush will use multiple cores and some things will use uh, one core. So if you can get the base, the best you can get is really fast processors and a lot of them. That's, that's your top tier, fast and lots. Um, your next step down would be, you know, fast and a good amount of processors. Um, and then also uh, like more processors will be like the third level. So that's kind of like your tier. So fast and lots, <laughs> lots of cores, fast cores and lots of them is your top. Um, next level would be, you know, fast cores, but maybe not a lot of them. And then your next one down is lots of cores. Uh, for the history recall brush, um, the unproject, you're going to have to probably smooth that back out. Alt will not change um, because basically it's just cutting in and out of the surface. It will uh, do the kind of opposite. So if you hold down Alt, it will cut in, but it's not going to end up giving you back what you want. Um, to recall back to that unproject, if you've done it, you basically want to store a morph target. So come down here to your original mesh and go to the morph target area and store a morph target first. Use your um, project uh, history recall brush or all the things like that on it. And then if you have areas you want to remove, you can definitely uh, use that morph brush and scrub them back out. You could also go back to say a duplicate version of your original tool and then project that one now with your undo history brush. And then that will give you that version of it projected back, which will fill in those areas. So that's probably your best way would be you have your one version you're projecting that has the carves in, the carve ins, and then you have two of your original ones. And so the, if you go through and carve in, then you want to bring the other surface back, just go to that other subtool, store that one, and then now project and it'll come back. That's high level. <laughs> uh, one last thing. Yes, uh, we'll, we'll cover this real quick. So to an easy way to bring in concept stuff, you have a few ways. Uh, one way, if you just want to do it really quick, is you have this see-through option at the top. So you can put anything behind ZBrush and then activate see-through. And this will allow you to see through to that image behind it. So if I had something, actually I do, let me see if I can get it quick. Because I, I talked about this and then I never did it. Where am I go here? Let's find this. Where are you at? Where are you at? Hold on, hold on. I got too many screens. Here we go. Okay, so let's say, here's my, oh man, come on, come on. There we go. There we go. We got, we got crazy gazelle, right? Look at that. Look at that. What is that gazelle doing? <clears throat> and then we'll go ZBrush. And let's say I want to see that image. So I just put it behind ZBrush and come up here and activate see through. And now I can see through to it. So I can move it around and I can see the crazy gazelle. And so I can actually use this as reference while I'm sculpting. So I can move them around. Maybe want to get, you know, this one's not even close, but <laughs> if I wanted to model something like that, you know, I could do it. And one thing nice about see-through is if you go to your UI, it's going to come back. And if you're in your canvas, it's going to go see-through. So this is one way that it's the fastest way to get, you know, just the image and reference really quick. Um, Cause you don't have to do anything other than come up to the top here and activate see-through. So you can put an image behind it and use that. Uh, another way to get image in real quick is if you just come to the uh, tool palette over here and we're just going to select a plain 3D object. And then I can go to the texture palette up here and there's an import and I can just import in my gazelle picture. Now, if you have these set square already, they're going to be your best bet. So you can just bring the import textures in. They're going to be square format and they're going to match this perfectly. After you have the texture loaded in, it will now reside up here. And then in this plain 3D object, we can turn it to a poly mesh or I could append it to my scene. So let's do this. We'll append in that plane 3D. It's going to come in like that. So I can manipulate it, move, scale, and rotate. If you hold down shift when you're rotating, it will snap. And I can position it somewhere like that. And then now I just need to link that texture to it. So in the tool palette, go all the way down to the texture map area. I'm going to click this option here and then select that texture I imported. And then you can reposition it. If it's a little bit hard to see, you can definitely switch your materials. We didn't cover this today. Um, the last stream, I covered the material stuff. 
and I can get a brighter material. And now I can see that crazy gazelle. I can kind of position to the side. I could sculpt more madness and use it as reference. So all different ways, um, but those are probably the, the two ones I'd recommend if you're just starting a with ZBrush that makes sense and it's very easy to do. So using the see-through, importing or appending a plain 3D object, and then importing a texture, and then applying that texture to the plain 3D object, going to the tool palette, texture map area down there. All right, so I think that is it. So one last question we have. Do you trust automatic retopology or prefer, prefer to do it manually? So I personally, the automatic retopology is gonna get you like 80% of the way there. So recently, if I have to do any topology stuff, I'll run it through that first and see what it gives me. And then I can go back in and edit it. Um, but there are times where maybe I just wanna spend the day doing topology, so I'll do it manually. Um, it just all depends. Uh, the, definitely now with uh, poly counts and stuff being higher for game engines and assets, you can get away, away with sloppier topology and have it look nice. Um, back in the day, it was pretty much do it manually to get it right, um, but now you've got a little leeway. So it just depends, and it depends on your time frame and your schedule too. If you've got a project and you need a character done in like a week, um, you're probably going to go for the automatic methodology rather than doing it manually, just because of time. All right, guys. Well, thank you and gals. Thanks for coming out. I appreciate it. Um, we have uh, more streams coming. I think uh, Dice K is next on April 6th. I'll be back on Wednesday. I don't know what I'm doing Wednesday. Friday is, um, no, Wednesday I'm making robots with insert mesh brushes. So that will be Wednesday. And then Friday we'll be doing Z Modeler stuff. So I hope that helps. You guys take care and uh, stay safe. Keep that social distancing up. And uh, till the next time, happy ZBrushing.